Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. No one is beyond help. No one is beyond hope. As we have always said, we are bringing you medical information and cutting edge science, but none of this is medical advice. Please seek out input from your own doctor. Hello and welcome back to the Low Carb MD Podcast. Tro unfortunately couldn't join us today and the Life's Best Medicine. This was actually scheduled for a Life's Best Medicine podcast, but the end ones are so special to me that I, I think everyone needs to hear about them. So we want to get the message out on my big brother platform and the, the little brother platform also. So Jen and David Unwin, it's such an honor to have both of you doctors here with me to uh, to share your story. And I think the viewers would be most happy if I was quiet most of the time on this one. So I, I'll let you two run the show. But Dr. Unwin, thank you for both Dr. Owens, but thank you for all you've done for bringing out food addiction and discussing dietary management and, and really hitting against the status quo by life experience and clinical experience. And, and that's something that's really inspired me along the way of, of keeping an open mind and trying to learn um, and maybe make the system better. So Doc mm -hmm. Senior, I'll let you uh, tell the story about how you met because I know it's intriguing and, and most of us don't have this story. Uh, so most of you won't know, but Jen and I are actually God, brother and sister. And so I'm going to explain how, how that is. And I'm also going to explain how it is that I've actually known Jen since she was a baby. Um, uh, this goes back a long way. And it's because my parents were Jen's godparents. And Jen's mom and dad were my godparents. So we actually, I'm a lot older than, a lot older than Jen. So that's how come I, I, I knew her as a, um, a, a baby. Um, and our, our family. Were best friends. They were yeah, best friends, friends from school. Yeah, our moms, our moms went to primary school together. Really so you nice. knew what you were getting into. That's, that, that's the thing. We, we both knew what, what, what the whole package. <laughs> <laughs> entailed because you when you marry you 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 marry the whole family in a way <laughs> and when you were young growing up like you you weren't having feelings for each other at that time and so later in well, life no, then you uh, you know I was at David's first wedding he was 24 when he got married and I was so that would have made me 18 I was just having a good old dance at the disco I just I just thought uh, David was great fun. I'd always thought he was uh, I loved when we went to visit them because he was six years older and he was just hilarious and uh, so interesting. And I loved his little sister who's 10 years younger. So she was a bit closer to my age and his mom and dad are on his dad, particularly an unusual character. So fascinating. And we were allowed to do more naughty things at their house than at my house. His dad used to play these kind of slightly loose records and stuff like that in the evening. And I got to stay up late. So it was all loads of fun. Uh, but no, obviously, you know, nothing at all like that. And then we kind of, we kind of re-met when I was about 31 and David was about 37 and he'll tell you why. <laughs> yeah. I think before you jump over those 20 years or 12 years, it was, uh, I, so my first wife, unfortunately, she went to medical school with me, but she turned out to have a drug and an alcohol problem. So I actually had 12 very unhappy and difficult uh, years. She wrote off, I think, three motor cars, big car accidents, loads of, of difficulty. And we didn't actually see each other at all uh, that I remember in that time. And then uh, my first wife, uh, left us very unfortunately to go into a mental hospital and I was left with two very young children and I I was lonely because I was caring for these two kids and in the evening I was so lonely and I remember my brother said you need to ring Jen promise me that you'll ring Jen and uh, this was probably about three months after my first wife had left me and we fell in love really fast over the phone because Jen lived at quite a distance away. Um, we just couldn't put the phone down. We kept saying, no, you know, you sometimes it'd be three hours on the phone and then your ear goes really crinkly and it hurts. And we we just couldn't stop chatting to each other. 
And I'm then Jen, never go stop on. chatting. <laughs> <laughs> We've been chatting on for 27 still, years now. Yeah, we're still <laughs> chatting. We're still chatting. When was that, Jen? About 1990. 1995. 1995. Yeah. Wow. Then, so you came in and you have Jen two young kids. I didn't realize I that, Dr. I didn't know was, that part of the story. It was a good yeah. job. I was a psychologist, let's say, because the poor souls were all really traumatized and damaged. And of course, so Robert was, I don't think he was even 18 months old and Katie was seven. And uh, yeah, so it was, it was, yeah, it was really tough. It was really tough for them. And that I, yeah, I learned to, I learned a lot coming from living on my own, doing what I liked, you know, city life to, you know, an instant <laughs> it's kind of complicated family situation. But it's uh, it's been it's been wonderful and brilliant. And my relationship with um, with the, with Kate, Katie's now. How old is she now? David? 30, About 34, 34, 35. Yeah. Robert's 29. And oh, we just we just all get on so well. We just think of ourselves as I never think of them actually as my stepchildren until I tell people a story but I just introduce them as my children they they introduce me as their mother and it's just lovely it's just lovely yeah, yeah. I think that's I'm so important say that unfortunately we should say that unfortunately David's first wife has passed away now so um yeah complicated yeah. Yeah, I think that and that speaks to addiction, you know, and what addiction can do, you know, maybe even being a very nice and loving person, but that in the throes of addiction and and also it brings out something that it happened to me too in in medical school or, or in residency. I had a, a doctor who's was having marital problems. And he had to drop out of out of the residency program and I had to cover for him for a month. And then the next year he dropped out the same time when I was on second call. So I had to cover him from all this other stuff, but it just shows the stress of medicine and going through training. And, and, you know, some people will turn to alcohol, some people will turn to other things to try to cope with. And and I think we can all agree. We're seeing a huge physician burnout problem, you know, across the world. Uh, and if you, now you've got that tendency um, to, to cope in that, in that way, then you've also got access, you know, unfortunately you, you can potentially have access to some, some quite powerful stuff, unlike, unlike the rest of us, if you like. So um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a real problem. I think I'd like to add a thing and it, it gave me a real insight into what it's like to be the relative of somebody who's addicted. So I, I tried for 12 years, I felt maybe I could cure her and but you can't externally it has to come from the person themselves and unfortunately many addicted people their their relatives are trying to solve them and i tried and tried and tried for 12 years and failed utterly but and then i blame myself i really did i felt that was a failure of 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 my work as a husband and I, my perspective is so different now yeah. It's so hard because you don't know when to uh, give up. When do you keep going? I mean, when's the last straw? When do you not give up? And I have some people who never gave up and their husband comes back around. But it took years and years and years. And sometimes it just never happened. So it's hard to have that discernment of, you know, when is it enough? You draw the final straw and say it's time to go. Mm. Well, that was really very, in the end, uh, my first wife, she left and went into hospital for months. Um, but it by that stage, we were all quite damaged, as Jen uh, as Jen said, and um, it was I, it was just so wonderful when Jen came into our lives, because I I remember my daughter, she was pulling on my arm. She she really felt I needed to get a girlfriend and fast. So she was giving me advice about how to get a girlfriend and what to wear and all the rest of it. And um, I remember Jen made me a cup of coffee. And Jen, uh, that was just an ordinary thing. But for, for, for my daughter, that was an amazing thing. And she had never seen that happen before at home. Um, and she assumed that because Jen had made me a cup of coffee, that she must love me and that I needed to ask her out. She said, Dad, Dad, that's amazing. She must love you because she made you a cup of coffee. And that's how desperate the children were to, you know, we were limping along. And then Jen came with her, her superwoman cape on. Hmm. And your kids were how old at that time? 
Uh, Robert was 18 months old oh, when boy. Jen first came, and Katie would be about seven. Wow. Yeah, that is a... Yeah, that's a tough one. Yeah, that's a it tough was. one. That's a lot of responsibility to step into. And that so that says yeah. a lot about you also, Jen, and Doc mm -hmm. going through uh, training. And, and you know, I, I know the stress of residency. If I didn't have my wife, I wouldn't have made it. There's no way I could have done yeah. it single. I mean, yeah. it's just it's just too much responsibility. I, I, I think what it did for me is uh, Jen has taught me so a lot, such a lot. And one of the things is about most of the things in your life are relative. So. For me, those times were so bad that since then I've been mostly cheerful because, you know, how can I possibly complain now when for 12 years I went through what I did, which was so tough? So relatively, I, I see myself as so, um, so lucky. Jen, I wonder if you could tell the story of the first family holiday that we had, because I think that was so funny. Yeah, well, I so as I say, I, I was used to this kind of um, single city life. And so holidays for me were like, take a friend, go to Europe, lie on a sun lounger, read books, kind of have the off odd cocktail, you know, because I was still doing that kind of thing in those days. Uh, you know, it was just two weeks of pure rest, really. And then we we took the children away and they were, you know, it was when they were they're still that age. And um, we went we actually went down to visit my parents. And uh, I mean, I mean, anyone who's got children will know the con. I mean, no lying about, no reading books. You're just on the go from <laughs> six in the morning till sort of eight at night. And uh, it was such a shock to the system. I think it got to about Thursday and I just, you know, burst into tears. <laughs> I mean, I was enjoying it and I wanted to do it, but I was just so exhausted <laughs> mentally by all the demands all the time. Yeah. Anyway, you, you train up. It's like athletics, isn't it? You know, you, you yeah. soon train up and that becomes normal. You know, that was then normal. We had a child of our own, Edward, who's now 22. So uh, we went back into babyhood eventually and, uh, and did it all again. So, yeah, it's hard when you're in your... 40s and you're trying to you know you're working I, so I was managing a lot of stuff I had a clinical health psychology department in a big hospital locally you're doing that you've got three kids and David's working as a really busy GP and yeah it, it, when you look back it, it, like you say David everything's relative so now you know our, our lives just feel like a bit of a holiday really you know we're doing this because we love it we get to travel together we get to discuss stuff together it's it, it's just perfection really it's uh yeah, we feel very, very, very blessed, really. Yeah, and you know, the other reason I want to have you on too is is this. I've noticed this with people that I associate with in the low carb community. Some of my heroes. Yeah, you know, I look at Dr. Fetke and his relationship. You know, they're the Fetkes, the Noakes, Tony Hampton. You know, Tro. You know, uh, um, so many others. You know, Ben Bickman. You know, I look at these are solid people, and I think they're what I find is that they have this solid relationship where they're not really concerned so much about what everyone on the outside says necessarily, like moving up the ladder, winning awards and things like that. And I think that's part of this where, where people have, you know, when you're, when you're solid in your relationship, I think you're able to do great things sometimes. Mm, you can just come back to that. And it's, it's sort of a, it's a platform to, to sort of launch into things and make you feel a bit braver to sort of, uh, yeah, I think you're right. You, you know you've got that sort of um that care and regard at, at home so you can you can sort of be brave and you can encourage each other to be to be perhaps braver than you would be if it was if it was just you you on your own you can discuss stuff and i think i think you're right there brian just to add to that i think the other thing is is jen that we have complementary skills mm. so and it, it goes like this. I used to think that um, I was very arrogant and I, I used to think that doctors, that we were the most important. And then I met Jen and I realized that if you're interested in behavior change, psychology, you need to understand motivation and psychology. And so for a while, I thought Jen was winning and that psychology trumped medicine. But then we were both in for a shock because we believe now that diet changes psychology so a good mm. diet can trump both uh, medicine and psychology because it can it, 
for many people, uh, improving their diet changes reality. And that's been yeah. such a, uh, uh, an amazing thing to discover. Neither training, you know, neither David's training nor my training as a, as a clinical psychologist entailed anything to do with nutrition. And it's it's just so powerful. I'm loving all the stuff that's coming out now about nutritional psychiatry and this kind of brain energy stuff. It's so relevant to, to everything we do to, to mental health. So people like George Ede, Chris Palmer, I mean, I'm just loving that. I think it's a fantastic development. And I, I really hope that 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 spreads, you know, that um, we all know what low carbon keto does for our physical health but I think there is you know for for some people it's it's like a, a, a miracle um in terms of you know and, and for addiction as well I think it you know I I think some of us that struggle with because I'm a food addict that's probably most people listening will know that that people who struggle with with addiction have got this sort of brain energy problem and they're seeking to solve it somehow and they're seeking to sort of get the brains working and for a lot of us that that involved you know eating more and more carbohydrate to try and get that you know that that clarity but of course you were digging yourself this terrible hole you know that the more you ate the 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 more unwell you became both sort of mentally and physically and so I think I think for some of us this this keto low carb thing is is it's a bit of a it's a bit of a miracle really and I think that's why in the community we all get so passionate about it and also so David watched me and of course he became passionate about low carb because he saw you see right at home the difference it makes to somebody you can't unsee that and it makes you really want to just go and tell the world you know that it, obviously it's not you know it's not a panacea for everything but it, it it seems to have such wide ranging mental and physical health benefits you you just want to get out there and and tell everybody um as politely as you can in our case i think a related thing to that jen is the effect on self-esteem when you understand what's going on mm. because for me watching you we used to argue because you'd be saying the diet starts tomorrow the diet start you go on for weeks with that and i remember sometimes on a sunday night you'd make a delicious pudding mm. which the kids would love but then you'd be making a tray bake and I, i'd say like i thought your diet started and you'd bite my head off because you were defensive and angry but i was so mystified. i was yeah i was so mystified i couldn't un i wanted to help but every time i tried to help you it made it worse and you were defensive and angry and it it was such a relief for me and probably for you as well, Jen, to understand that you weren't a, actually a mad woman. Mm. You are an intelligent woman. And, and to choose. understand that you can, um, you know, because we'd all been brought up with this. So my my mum was a cereal dieter. You know, it was all about low fat in, in the house. Both my parents were sort of trying to do this low fat thing. Um, and, you know, that that in the 70s and 80s that that's how we were brought up you know that fat was this kind of demon thing so it was it was amazing to learn that you could you could eat a different way because I um I'd always been trying and I think a lot of people in my generation had always been trying to adhere to these guidelines and just constantly failing so to learn that actually it's okay to to cut out these carbs whether they're complex or not um and to you know to eat protein and fat was just such a, a real just like a sort of revolutionary revelation and it it means it meant that you could yeah that then you didn't have to think that I would you know you were a failure because you couldn't adhere to these healthy guidelines you know what's wrong with me that I can't I can't do that um that's okay because you don't actually have to do that and those pro probably aren't healthy guidelines and it but just about everything that we ever did had been turned on its head. So, we, you know, yes, increasing fat, having more protein, you know, it's okay to have salt. All of uh, you don't have to eat breakfast. All of those things were were sort of um, a little bit mind blowing at the time. But of course, now we've been doing it about 10 years that we're still tweaking things, but it's completely routine. And then it, within the family, it's kind of spread from us. So we started and then you know, one by one, the kids, even though they're adults now, without us forcing it on them in any way, just they recognize that they feel better and they 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 do it. Our grandchildren are more or less, well, they are being, being brought up this way. And then David's 
mom was a type two diabetic. She's amazing now. She's 86 and still going strong, wonderful blood sugars. And also, you know, people would come to the house like the electrician or, you know, and you'd get into a conversation and then they'd come back three months later to check your boiler. They've lost two stone and put the diabetes into remission. So it's it's sort of it's just sort of spread because we we believe in it. It, it and you when you talk to people you explain it to them and it's just spread and spread really and that's that's just amazing when you you know yeah you've literally been talking to somebody who's been to your house and you see them a few months later and they and they just look amazing and feel amazing and that's that's the best feeling really and of course all all David's clinics he's seeing that happening all the time now. I wonder if we could just go back to how it was that we began in in 2012. I think that's interesting. So before 2012, but the first thing is I'd never seen drug-free type 2 diabetes remission in 25 years of medicine. I didn't know it was possible, probably a bit like you, Brian, where I just thought diabetes was a chronic deteriorating condition and I prepared people to get sicker and for me to have to medicate them more. So this as kind of epiphany around 2012, along with, I think, with, with Jen realizing about diet and she looked so much better. But there was more to it than that. There was, I met my first ever patient who put her diabetes into remission and I was so curious as to what she'd done. And then the next thing was, was, was an intervention, a psychological intervention of Jen's when we were on, um, we were on a run together and I was feeling a bit depressed. I, I felt sorry for myself because I was 55 years old, Brian. That's very old, isn't it? Oh, 55 yeah. Years, very old. 55 years old. And I was so disappointed with what I'd achieved in medicine. And m- most of my friends were retiring. And in fact, they all did. I was the only one of that age that didn't. And then Jen's, I'm going to let Jen tell the intervention. So she took me a run. Um, <laughs> A slow run, and and Absolutely. changed our and changed our lives with a, a psychological interference. Go on, Jen. Yeah. So the way that I practice as a psychologist is this sort of um, positive psychology, solution focused sort of approach, where you you're very interested in people's best hopes. So not what's wrong with them, or you know what's going wrong in their lives, but you know if their lives were better, what would it look like? So you know I'd noticed, David, there were. I think at the time, actually, there were two things going on. One was that he was a bit burnt out and fed up with medicine and everybody was just getting sicker and sicker. But also he was getting a little bit sick because we we were the we were very carbtastic, you know, because we're both. I mean, I'm a carb addict, but David loves loved the carbs as well. And of course, I was cooking that way. So uh, in retrospect, we know that he he probably was becoming you know, at least pre-diabetic because he blood pressure was going up and I uh, was putting on weight. And he, he was having a little sleep in the afternoons. He was <laughs> turning into an old guy. So we went on this run and I I, I kind of did my thing and said, you, you know, well, you know, of course you can retire, but, you know, it sounds like you'd like to sort of go out with a bang rather than a fizz, you know, and if that were the case, what one final project might might you do or you know we've never worked together even though we both work in south but we'd never actually work together because i had my job and he he had his you know and i said you know what about a, a joint project on something and then he came up with you know he'd like to do something for the type 2 diabetics and i i had a lot of experience running groups um in my job and i knew the power of of groups and of course that's something that gps you know, never did and probably still don't do very much, although I think it's perhaps coming a bit more. So I said, you know, we could we could run a we could run. I'll do the group bits and you can do the, the sort of clever bit. And we'd already just started learning about low carb from my experience. So we thought, um, you know, it came up with this idea to run a low carb group at the practice that was for initially pre-diabetics. We we're a bit too scaredy pants to do actual actual diabetics. Um but we didn't actually we didn't really realize how controversial it was what we were what we were doing. It just seemed like a good, good idea. It made sense. <laughs> Medically made sense and psychologically. So uh so off we went. And then unfortunately, then we realized it was a bit controversial at the time, less so now. Um, the dietitian um heard about it and then just walked out and never came back to the practice, <laughs> the practice. 
Um, and when David talked about it, the, the initial results, which we we published the first 18 people, can't believe that that was the, that was the first paper, wasn't it? Um, and he went to talk about that at a couple of conferences and actually got booed by, by various people. I, I don't think that would ever happen now. So, uh, no, yeah, we, no, I was shout, I was shouted down uh, when people they I I was really amazed at the anger against me, and I was only going to tell people like this is working, and I felt ethically I sh I needed to tell people, and the the hostility was really astonishing. I just couldn't ex understand it. When people heard my name, they would literally turn away from me and refuse to speak. That shows your strength because through your strength. I'm standing up peacefully, I was, you know, and not being a jerk back to everyone like our tendency would be just to take it and keep moving forward and keep moving forward and showing your data. That's what I love about you both is that you say, look, here's it's working for us because, you know, I get yeah. smug now when I hear it. Like when you first started, I, I was getting arrogant just listening to you because on episode number 10 and 13, we talked about addiction and food addiction. What we were seeing clinically, Tro and I were saying, hey, we're seeing people their anxiety is getting better. Their depression is getting better. And from your side of the pond, I got attacked for 30 days. Someone actually said, you should have your med medical license revoked for even discussing food could have anything to do with mental health, right? And at that same wow. time, you were saying, you know, certain people, and, and I could, I, I mean, this is one of the things I laughed when I saw you say this was, uh, you know, certain patients would come and you go, oh, I need three biscuits to deal with this patient, right? Yeah. There's a three biscuit patient or a two biscuit yes. patient because the yeah. stress, and that just speaks to our, the stress we have of jobs of, of uh, interacting with human beings that can be fallible but and difficult, and, but also that in times of stress, we do turn to food, clearly. It, it's clearly, or we turn to alcohol, or we turn to, to uh, coffee to get us going in the morning, whatever it might be. So cl and clearly, the person who was attacking me was a pediatrician. I say, clearly, you must see kids who get hopped up on ice cream all day, and then they get dropped off from grandma and grandpa's house, and they're a disaster and emotional wrecks. You don't see that, you know, or eat too much hot sauce and think you're not going to be in yeah. a bad mood the next day, you know. So there's so much of that that it's 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 actually very intriguing to see the mental health part, because again, like going back to what you were talking about was we see the benefit of the mental health, but the mental health is critical. And so is the physical health. So if your physical health is not right, then if you're addicted to alcohol, you can't really reason with that person when they're drunk. Right. So mm -hmm. it takes both sides of the equation to get it right. Yeah. We just started with the diabetic people, but then you could see that in, in that group, their mental health was in, in vastly improved there's um you know a couple of people i'm thinking about who came off medication whose memory was so much better etc cetera, etc cetera. so that was when we started thinking oh <laughs> there's some, something in this from the from the mental health side as well and we really wish we'd we'd put, popped a little mental health screen you know way back when we started collecting the data um yeah i mean that's it isn't it you, the results just speak for themselves and that's why i think so David would come back from these conferences and we'd be like, what is it they don't like about people getting better? You know, what why why this emotional sort of fury? And and we just put it down to, you know, for some people, their whole careers have been based on these models. And I can see that that's a little bit disturbing, you know, for 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 to then hear something that's really counter to everything that that you believed to be true, you know, that so you know, I'm sure that's where it came from. When I look back now, though, those people did me a favor because I felt so vulnerable in 2013. I realized I had a responsibility to start collecting data. And I'd say this to all clinicians. If you notice something, start being methodical, collect data. And my data set now goes back to 2013. And I, I'm, it's a lot of work because after every clinic, I'm updating the data set. And we've got hundreds of patients, but it, it's such a valuable thing. And the, so my enemies frighten me. And, and so I worried about lipid profiles. I worried about renal function. I worried about, I was worried all the time. So I started collecting data. And then, whoa, wow. the data became so interesting. The p-values are minute if you look at before and after. And then I've got the basis of publishing. and you you get taken more seriously. And then your enemies now, people, I'm not attacked nearly as often because genuinely I'm collecting data 
and they have done for 10 years, and the data speaks for itself. Uh, the mm. people are improving in so many ways. And as Jen has just said, I wish now at the very beginning, there were, I wish I'd measured a few other things, particularly we could have done the mental health state would have been. But I, we didn't know how many things would improve. Skin is improving, skin quality. And Brian, you must see this all the time. Joint pain, another one. Joint um, pain, asthma, you know, psoriasis. I, I'm seeing people just healing of things and you look and you think, wow, yeah. this is crazy. I mean, for me, and, and people will always say, oh, well, they, they have a financial gain. It doesn't matter to me what you eat. I don't own a grocery store. I don't own these products. You know, I'm not selling any products. So I'm just seeing what I'm seeing and it's hard. And I think that's one thing that you brought to point, which I think is critical for people to understand is as doctors, we make observations. We see what's happening. Yes. We say it's not working. Then we change course. But it seems like in medicine, the hardest thing to say is I had it wrong. You know, when 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 um, Professor Noakes came and said I had it wrong, I was wrong. He, he ripped these pages out of my book. It was incorrect. To say, to do that, that shows someone of strength of to say, yeah, I had it wrong, and now I've looked at more evidence. Just as you would have, if your evidence said, hey, everyone's having a heart attack, they may be thin and their diabetes gets better, they have a heart attack, and you say we can't do this because you care about people and you want to do the right thing. Mm. You know, and I think that's we've gotten to the point where everyone knows better. Even though that's not working, they keep doing it. As an example, I have a patient I was just talking to. I'm I'm consulting with her just for the metabolic health stuff. She clearly had shingles and it was going through her eye and she had a rash. She went to urgent care two times. They said, oh, yeah, it might be a spider bite. What are you going to say? So they put her on an, two different antibiotics where they cleared. You look at the diagnosis, and you know what it is in a second. Anyone knows that. But they weren't able to change course of being convinced there were spiders that live in her area. So maybe it had to be a spider that walked across her face and stung her a bunch of times. So unless you say, wait a minute, this isn't working, let's change course, <laughs> you know, you yeah. don't get the right answer. Yeah. My pers- I've got a perspective on that, which is also relates to Jen and I. So for a while, Jen was an academic and I'm an absolute clinician. And so Jen has an insight into the world of academia because she published before me and and was a university lecturer for years. And when I look now, I think what has happened is evidence-based medicine is largely contributed to by academics. And many of the clinicians like you and I are so tired that we don't contribute very much to the discussion. And yet I now believe that it, clinicians offer exactly as much as academics. And it's like a yin and yang thing. You need academics, but you also need clinicians who know what actually works with ordinary patients in North America or in the North of England. And that the, the, the voice of the clinicians is hardly heard. And in fact, very often, if you try as a clinician to say, well, that's funny, it doesn't really, that doesn't fit in with my, you get shouted down by the academics, not all of them, uh, some of them. But I really feel progress is about a, an equal standing between experienced clinicians and the clever academics. We need both, definitely. And you had the, you had the, the I, I know you were sending letters to all these ac- people in academia and only one person really responded, it sounds yes. like, right? Well, that, yeah, I'd, I'd like, so... At the beginning, the the results were so astonishing that I I, I felt well I have an ethical thing here I, I need to publish this, but I was also a bit embarrassed because the results seemed too good to be true, because normally when if you if you look at well what does a drug achieve, you'll get a a three percent improvement or something. I'm getting fifty percent improvement, so it, I felt they're going to think I'm a phony, so I actually sent the data. I think to about 20 professors and only one answered me. And that one was Roy Taylor from Newcastle University, who's internationally famous. And what a gentleman, uh, because he he said, this is really important, David. And he's, he's, funnily enough, he and I are working on a joint paper at this moment. Anyway, he said, this is important. It's the world needs to know. And and um, he said, you need to get it into an Excel spreadsheet, which I didn't even, I couldn't run one of those. Uh, so he did all the stats for us for the first paper, just on 18 patients. And if he hadn't, I think he really helped me by be, as an academic, he believed in me. And, and what a gentleman, what a hero. 
I, I'm so uh, grateful. But of course, Jen had already published as well, so she knew how to write a paper. And you used to do a lot of correcting, didn't you, Jen? I did. I did. Uh, it's incredible because they, you know, he's he'd never even had a thought of publishing anything. He's quite dyslexic, so he couldn't he couldn't spell the words. He didn't have to organise a paper. So the first one was a, a really big joint effort. But as time's gone on, he's just utterly like this last one. I've hardly been involved with at all. He just can write papers and. Uh, it's just incredible now when when you're motivated how you can overcome just about anything really you know uh, like it's it, it's amazing and also he didn't even have a smartphone at the beginning and he used to poo poo the kids going on social media and what nonsense it was and don't give me a smartphone I don't want people to contact me and now he's got how many thousand Twitter fo- followers have you got 60, yeah that's something we got to talk about <laughs> we have to get Jen some Twitter there's a competition going on between these two so we have to get Jen some Twitter followers yes please it's <laughs> um, at Jen I, Unwin I, right? I right I never will actually catch up but isn't isn't that incredible it was so anti all of this kind of modern te- you know modern technology social media oh bar humbug and then and then just slowly slowly is is uh you know, he's built up this fantastic following. And it's just brilliant because it is, you know, it is getting, it's getting the word out. Um, well, and I think, you know, the other thing that's, <clears throat> excuse me, important is, Dr. Underwood, you've done it with uh, dignity and 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 uh, tax, right? Some of us get so frustrated. I mean, for me, sometimes I just get so frustrated. I was like, okay, good thing I have a filter and a wife that keeps me from posting certain things. But, um, but the reality of, of me seeing you, I remember the first time you were on Diet Doctor, I saw that. I'm like, who's this guy? What's this going to And I said, this is a clinician. This is someone who understands stuff. And someone to say, I've been doing it wrong for all these years. Now I'm doing this and here's my results. And so you as a clinician spoke to me, right? You spoke to me more than anything. The science is there. Okay, we got science. We got people saying, you know, what, what Fedke and Noakes are doing, great. But as a clinician saying, look, I've been doing this all these years and I've completely changed. And, and the the thing is, being at 55, you start thinking, why don't you just said, retire? if you don't go for that jog with Jen and you just say, I'm done, I'll just walk away. And then how much, you know, your studies on, on high insulin and hypertension spoke to me. And I can tell people that every single day, your, your um, uh, infographics on how much sugars and everything, that is something people understand, not the science of, you know, making it so complicated. Yeah. And also, uh, you know, you're, I remember you talking about high triglycerides causing, you know, uh, crossing the blood brain barrier, making you um, hungrier. And then that cycle that we can get into. So when people start understanding these things on a simple level, <laughs> we can do great things. It's just that when we make it so complicated, people say, I have no idea you're talking about, you know, yeah. the Krebs cycle. I, I'm, I'm not listening anymore. It's too complicated. Yeah. I think there's, a, there's two threads there. I, th- I think one of them is that primary care. Um, we understand our patients and we, you have to be able to chat with a teenager or a 90 year old and the skill you get better at communicating. And of course, you then notice what works and what works is when people understand what you, instead of me telling you what to do, you understand the physiology. And I think explain instead of patients memorizing diet sheets, it's so much more helpful if they can understand the physiology and then they can adapt their life to to the physiology that they understand so um i think that's one thread the other thread is that as you grow older um you just you have to be humble because maybe i'll be wrong again you know i've been wrong before and you have to be open jen and i are constantly tweaking uh what we're learning and being trying to be observant and this is a good clinician is observant and prepared um to factor in what we observe with what we suggest for patients um i, I think the third thing that i discovered that the, the the trolls i now know what a troll is on twitter but they feed they love it if you if you get angry they just and you all you do is help them and upset yourself and in the early days, I spent a lot of time being upset because I thought, I just can't believe what people are saying about me. And and I'd wake up in the middle of the night, and that's ridiculous. Um, it, it's ridiculous. I don't look at the responses unless it's a friend of mine or someone that I'm following. Yeah. 
I don't take advice from strangers on the street either if they don't know the science. And so I can't <laughs> convert everyone to the religion, right? So yes. at some points you just dust your feet and move along. Yeah. yeah. I can't I can't decide really whether it's a bit like what we have is is we've got some aggressive warriors and then you've got peaceful people like Jen and I. I think actually it benefits from us both. I think the warriors push things on and, and some people like that approach. Uh, but then again, more quieter people like Jen and I are perhaps we don't frighten people as much. So I think we progress well with a with a variety of approaches. And Jen and I have one type of approach and other people have different ones. But I think we we do well moving ahead together and uh, let's all just be ourselves. I think that's the be true to yourself is probably the thing. Well, I think what you both do is bring hope. You know, that's something that's why I started Life's Best Medicine. So I saw people want to take everyone's hope away and live in fear. And it's like, OK, there, there can be a better day. There will be a better day, you know. And so it's hard. Sometimes we get so caught up. And that's when, you know, we all know that the big, at least Tro and I see this is that the biggest causes of failure on any program is going to be stress, you know, stress and lack of support. And like like Jen, you're saying is group meetings. Like I do zoom meetings with my patients and it's so fantastic because I could sit back and they're helping each other. No one's criticizing yes. the other person when they're struggling, they're going to lift them up. Yes. It's wonderful. Isn't it? That's, that's, Oh, that is just so magic. I love, I love that when that happens in, in groups, I, re, I really do. I think it's uh, yeah, it's absolutely wonderful. And yeah, I hope, hope is everything, you know, and anyone who comes to see any of us, has some they're hopeless but they have some hope otherwise they wouldn't have turned up they've got some hope that you can in some way help them and so you know it it behoves us to find out what it is that better would be like for them and then get on the journey with them not not just assume that we know what what better is like for them or you know just give them a big dollop of advice you know we we kind of find out what 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 a better life is going to look like for them and then Get, as I say, get on that, get on that journey with them, celebrate when they make, you know, even tiny bits of progress, put them in touch with other people, put them in, a, put them in the groups. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's uh, you know, it's as much, it's as much, does us as much good as it, it does them, I'm yeah. sure. Jen, I think the core of this, the very best medicine is when you have shared goals with your patients. And Brian, I bet you'll wreck when it just feels in your bones good when you and a patient are moving together. I had loads of these yesterday afternoon in my clinic where we are cheering, you know, when you get type two diabetes remission, I, I got two yesterday afternoon. It's so wonderful for the patient and the doctor. And that's got to be uh, uh, the best way to do medicine in a sort of flexible way, listening to the patients and seeing, can we find some shared goals? Because when you've got shared goals, well, even if it goes badly, it's a shared disaster and you don't get a complaint because we kind of, we're going to try that together. But very often it, two and two can equal five. The synergy of a hopeful patient and a hopeful doctor, it's mm. absolutely yeah. wonderful. And, and I owe a lot of that to Jen teaching me right from the beginning. I was so frightened of doing groups because all my confidence was just on one-to-one. -one. I was so nervous of running groups because I, I thought it could all, I thought it could disintegrate into them shouting at me or something. Um, but group work is fun. And, and Jen, you taught me that because you'd run so many for many years. And I think it's a, difficult for GPs to step from one-to-one -one where, where we're confident into group work which adds extra magic but you lose it you're giving up control and and i don't but think also, we're all used to giving up control so when you want the one work um you really change because in the beginning it was all like you know i've i know the answer you know it's take this tablet or you know why don't you go walk every day and this this sort of giving of advice even if it's done in a very kindly way i mean if if advice change behavior none of us would smoke or drink or do anything like that. It's just, it's just not sufficient um, to do that. And, and you, and you were brave enough to really change the way that you consulted with people to, to ask them about, 
their best hopes and get these shared goals and then in, in encourage them. You 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 know it, you're it's indescribably different now how you consult to compared to when we you know when we met in 1995. <laughs> I think a lot of the difficulty for many clinicians, so in the UK, we only have 10 minute appointments, Brian, I don't know how long you have, but in the NHS, we're only given 10 minute appointments. So you're, you're in const, it's very stressful because you, you can run really late in a clinic like that. And then you get complaints and the waiting rooms is rebellion in the waiting room. So it takes a lot of confidence to let go of the consultation and let the patient talk. And a lot of us become better and better at controlling the consultation so you can finish it at nine and a half minutes. So you can, and then that you have to unlearn that skill uh, because otherwise you're too controlling and the, you, you never learn what it was the patients came with. I spent years working on efficiency. Now, yes. because I'm in direct primary care, basically patients pay me a monthly fee no matter what, how many times they see me. So I'm in no hurry. I schedule long appointments. So I have an hour with the patient, an hour and a half sometimes, you know, depending on what we're trying to accomplish and how sick the patient is. But you try to do that in, in America, it's the same. You know, people in a lot of systems have seven minutes with a patient. Do you think they're going to talk about what's happening at home or alcohol abuse? Or You can't. You're saying, here's a Band-Aid, here's a Band-Aid, here's a Band-Aid. Yeah. Good luck with your healing. And so it's really, that's what it's become. We've lost that human contact. You know, yeah. you know, there's, there's a resident I, I had come to my practice. Guess what? It, out of my entire residency program where I graduated from, one doctor is going into, direct, in, into primary care. One. That's it. One. They're all going into either specialties or working in the hospital. So there's a lot because they're looking saying, why would I want to spend all that overhead and liability and, and have seven minutes and have to pay for the lighting bill and all these other, and, and staff? I'll just go bill and go home at night. So it's really there. We've lost the way you have. That's why what you were doing spoke to me, because I'm thinking, am I the only one who is sitting here in the system thinking I can't be? See, you know, there was just a paper that came out saying in, in family practice, you need 26 hours a day in order to do all your duties that you have to do. And, and that, that's legitimately true. That was published. And so you go, how, how can you possibly do that? So you can either keep trying to run faster and faster on the treadmill that's going too fast, or you say, I got to get off the treadmill. So a lot of doctors in the U.S. because of the burnout are saying, I'm going to do direct primary care, limit my patient load and really help those patients because I every day I laugh and have fun with my patients because I'm not in a hurry. Mm -hmm. But before it was this, doctor, there's three people waiting. You have to hurry. And I'm like, oh, this person's going to get diabetes if I don't intervene now. It's going to happen. I see the labs. I see all these. I know that we, we've seen it enough with our clinical experience. You think, gosh, I can't help that person. And then you start realizing the system is against the patient and you think, wow, what are we doing? This is insanity. Yeah. That yeah. brings me to another one of the themes that Jen and I have explored all our married life. And, and it's to do with what is it to be, a, what's the essential human? What is it to be human? Because when you step towards what it is to be human, then you're more likely to succeed. And every time you step away from what it is to be human, you're more likely to be stressed and unhappy. And Jen and I have often thought about um sort of paleo psychology, what are we hardwired both in our minds and in our physiology? And I think we're hardwired mm -hmm. to enjoy other human beings, to tell stories that family continuity of relationships matter. And that every time we step away from that, you become more stressed. Um, and and I, I think my, the way I do medicine now is, is much closer to how a shaman might have behaved in the village, in the paleo village. Um, I, I do an interesting thing with medical students, which is I say, right, I'm taking away all your drugs. I'm taking away all your investigations. You're on a desert island with somebody in distress. Let's talk about how you're gonna help somebody with just your brain to help that person. And it's a very popular teaching uh, module, getting back to how can we help other human beings without reaching for the prescription pad. And being a human being, I think that is the, the primary thing. So, you know, there's a saying, no one cares what you know until they know that you care. And so, you know, a lot of yeah. doctors are so 
they're hurting, they're struggling. They're, they're struggling with alcohol when they get home, trying to calm their nerves or biscuits or whatever it is. And so I'm seeing more and more of my physicians are the ones I worry the most about because I see, I see the ramifications of, first of all, the fear that's been instilled in, in the population, but also just seeing that I'm not helping anyone. And I felt that way with my diabetics, I would watch them progress from, from, you know, sugars are high, then all of a sudden they're blind in one eye, then they're, they're, they get foot ulcers, then they get an amputation, then they're on dialysis. And you see that, that ship sailing out to sea that's going to sink <laughs> and you don't want to get on that ship anymore. And, and for me, it was like, gosh, if I can intervene. And I saw so many people that finally got it and tried to change, but it, the damage was done, yeah. you know, the neuropathy and all this stuff. And you go, gosh, I can't reverse this ship very well. But um, if we intervene earlier, if we educate people, you know, we can really help. And that's, Jen, going back to the group thing, you know, my epiphany really was I, I was at a medical conference. Rob Sivis was talking about stress management, believe it or not. And uh, a patient was standing and I, and I talked to Rob after his talk, was asking him a couple of questions. And and there was a patient, there was a lady standing there and, uh, uh, you know, she was waiting and waiting. And I, I turned around and said, oh, my goodness, I'm so sorry. I apologize. I said, I didn't realize you were waiting in line to talk to Rob. I, you know, we're going to have dinner in an hour. I'm, I, I apologize. It was rude of me. And she goes, oh, no, doctor, you're Dr. Lenskis, right? Yeah. She goes, I want to talk to you. And I said, you do? I hadn't spoken yet or anything. And she said, uh, you saved my life. And my husband, this is my husband, this is my friend, this is our neighbor. And I was like, they flew in from Mexico City to meet me because our podcast, wow. she listened to it when she was out for a walk one day. And she's come off all of her diabetes medicines, her husband. I mean, it's in, it's absolutely incredible. I've never met the person. But sometimes mm -hmm. what you're saying now will reach so many people. That's why it's so critical is that you reached me. <laughs> you reached me and convinced me saying, hey, let me try something different. If it doesn't work, I get rid of it and say, this guy's a fraud. But it was working. And Jason Fung and some of these other people that came along and say, hey, these are these these people seem pretty reasonable as clinicians. They understand what they're talking about. And it's amazing how much blowback there is. It just is shocking mm -hmm. to me. And you could tell people, you could toot your horn here. You're what, what you call a sur What do you guys call it? A surgery though, over there, right? That you, were, yes. you had the least amount of medications and, and saved money for the system and all those. Oh, kind yeah. Of things. Oh, oh, I see. I can show off. Yes. Okay. I'll yes. So of all the 20 practices in our area in the northwest of England, we spend far less than anybody else on drugs for diabetes. And in fact, um, we, we save it's 70,000 pounds sterling per year on drugs for diabetes alone because I use them so infrequently now. Uh, and the other thing, going back, Brian, to what you were saying, I haven't referred a single person with diabetes to a vascular surgeon. I haven't referred a single patient with diabetes for an amputation for 10 years. Not one. And I haven't seen a diabetic ulcer either. Now, those are really serious things. So something big is happening at my practice because they are so much healthier because you see, I've had years and years to get at them all and ring them up and chase them. Um, it's very, very exciting. Um, very exciting. And then you have time to talk about the the wife and kids and husband because you're not trying to fix all the problems and not you know you're trying to patch all the holes all the whole time. You can yeah. really sit and know them as yeah. a human being. Well, it's actually more efficient because when I think now of some of the people that were coming in weekly with pain, with ulcers, with whatever. Depression. Well, just add those 10, yeah, depression, add those 10 minutes up. And over the years, I was spending hours with those people, only they made me despair. Now, they're my favorite kind of patient. So I, I saw somebody yesterday who's uh, had a stroke, they're only 59, um, and they they said I could discuss them. Uh, and within weeks, the blood sugar, I, I'm using continuous glucose monitor. The blood sugars have changed and they have hope. They're so happy. And they said, you you can talk about us. And they've sent me all of their Freestyle Libra blood sugar monitoring results because within weeks, you can make, you can turn somebody just despairing. Uh, and they're so grateful. And that's what I just, I can't give it up. I feel so much better about myself now because I've always said, how can Dr. Unwin do all this without a continuous glucose monitor? He's doing all these things. <laughs> you were doing it for years and years without that. So I got to cheat the system right away and say, let's put this on. Then yeah. when people see what happens, they say, oh my goodness. And then they can say, that's not worth it. It's not well, worth I need it. To come, I need to come clean. I'm breaking the rules now. I'm turning in, into, a, is it called a disruptor? So we're not allowed to prescribe 
the Freestyle Libra for people with type 2 diabetes. But I'm increasingly, if they're on insulin, I do not understand why they shouldn't have that help. So I am prescribing it for short periods of time. And if, if I'm chucked into jail, then we'll see. I, I'm, I'm getting angry about the help available to people with type 2 diabetes. It's not enough. And I think we can, we can do better. So I'm beginning to experiment with the, the CCG now. Yeah, I think it's it's really important, you know, it really to have the numbers because then my opinion doesn't matter anymore. The patient could see it and they say, "Oh my goodness, guess what?" When <laughs> after his infographics do work because when I eat the yeah. stuff that he says has a lot of sugar, my sugars go crazy, and then people will argue that point and say it doesn't. I'm like, okay, here's the data. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just yeah. like you said, collecting data. That's why I collect data on my patients, and I'm not mm-hmm. a researcher, but I know what I'm seeing. It's very clear. And and the other thing that the research is now, and Jen, you could speak to this. You know, even Ben Bickman just posted something yesterday. Talk because I've observed it. The more stressed you are, the more you're going to struggle with sugars and and obesity and and going off the wagon and all those things. And we're mm-hmm. living in a stressed, depressed culture. And so we think, oh my goodness, how how? And you know, there's data showing physiologically what happens with stress, with cortisol levels, with insulin levels, with with the, all the stress hormones. And so you could be eating a nice diet and still get diabetes if you're stressed, intense, and hate the world. And that's part of why we're all talking here. Hmm. For sure, yeah. It just goes back to this, yeah. The 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 environment we we live in, and um, yeah, the, the the stress we're under, and you know, sl- lack of sleep, and all of these things affect us. And we have to just go back to evolutionary psychology, evolutionary biology. You know, what? How did we have evolved to live? And it, it you know, it wasn't like this. So you know, all of us in our, in our own way have to think about how we design our lives to be sustainable and I think that's something we can help patients with as well and we you know we say well yeah this you know the the probably the the sugar in your diet is massively important and that's you know like David always says that you know that's going to make the biggest difference but then once we've got that sorted out there are other things that you can you can focus on if you're you know if you if your blood sugars are still not right or if you're still not losing weight or you know what else can you look at in the environment around sleep, stress, you know, exercise, downtime, socializing with family, being with family and friends and and just kind of kicking back. I think there's loads of evidence, isn't there, that, you know, when they weren't hunting, you know, our, our ancestors were kind of lying around because they, they probably were mostly carnivores and they're a bit a bit like lions, you know, they have a big feed and then kind of, you know, chill out for a bit well you know not many of us do much much chilling out uh in our certainly in our middle age we, we, it is this kind of pressure to 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 work to you know what whatever it is there's a pressure to be busy or busy seems to be kind of equated with good and you know kicking back is you know we we feel it's a kind of lazy thing to do so um yeah yeah, we feel guilty if we take a day off and say, I'm not dealing with stuff. You know, I, I rarely do still, you know, I really, but I enjoy what I do too. So it's not like I'm tortured the entire time. I enjoy my days here at the office. I may not work a lot less, but I have a lot more satisfaction and I'm happy coming to work and I enjoy my patients. And, you know, I like to cheat the system a little bit and have healthy patients that I can try to keep healthy rather than trying to reverse the damaged blown up engine, you know, change the oil instead. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's it. And, and to have that, per, you know, that sense of purpose, that sense of believing in what you do, you know, a lot of people's jobs these days, are, you know, they're working for money, you know, as we all must to get by. But, you know, a lot of those jobs aren't necessarily um, satisfying to them. They don't have a lot of control over. And, you know, that 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 sense of control is another, uh, you know, a lack of that is, is a real problem for people's health and, and well-being. So just coming back to that sense of control, Jen, I like the idea of patient or the concept of patient activation. So what what I find is you usually start with a deactivated passive patient. But if they can have one, yeah, they feel hopeless and helpless. But if they can have one success in their lives, they're awake. And then then I say, what are you going to do next? And they say, oh, the smoking or the cannabis or the whatever. Yeah. And and what I think is, is I look for the low hanging fruit, which I think is often diet, but not always. But then the, the you know, when you, you think, Jen, about some of the cases we've helped, then they mm-hmm. go on 
to look mm. at jobs, to look at yoga, photography, all sorts of the hu- how to improve the human experience. And yeah, they I think feel more a, capable, don't they? They feel yes, more they're activated. They they've got self-esteem they've got confidence that they can make a change in their lives they come from a place of sort of yeah just basically victimhood a victim of modern life yeah. to um, no, I, I can control what i put in my mouth or i can control when yeah. i go for a walk or and i feel so much better so and i think that's what you did for me jen so when i was 55 i would i was kind of a victim to being senior partner of a large practice so i had nine and a half thousand patients my life was just one giant problem and and yeah. it was so hard and i'd become crushed i felt crushed and i i looked crushed yeah and i didn't have a thousand patients yeah that's, oh my goodness that's i was i was a cry baby at around 2300 patients yeah oh it, wow. remember though no i was senior partner so there were there were f- uh, probably in those days four partners looking after nine and a half thousand patients i was the senior okay, partner so- and that, so, and that means that you take overall responsibility for all the complaints, all the staff, all of the finances. And anyway, the point was I felt crushed, but I had partly trapped myself by thinking about money far too much. Mm. And, and the best thing that Jen ever said, so she said, David, why don't you do this, this work for, for people with type of uh, pre-diabetes? And I said, because I, we're not paid. And it was Jen who said, you know, I thought I'd married a doctor and how many cars do we have and that kind of thing. And really, yeah. p- possessions trap us. And what I do now is I don't think how much are you pay. I don't think, Brian, how much are you paying me to do this? I think how much fun is it? Am I enjoying it? Does it fit in with my goals? And that's been really liberating. So not, let's not reduce everything down to dollars, really. That's so tragic because there's a lot more to being human. And since I've stopped thinking about money, the practice has actually become very successful because our reputation is so good and and their finances are now better than they were. But not because we thought about money, but because we started thinking about quality and being good doctors. And, And that's what I think Jen released me. I was on a tram line and then I went from one success and now my my mind is open for things that may be fun and new goals. And Jen and I often talk about our our goals, but this is the solution focused approach that Jen knows all about. Mm. And Mm. also I'd read the research that showed that above a certain income, you're not actually any happier. You need a certain amount. Obviously you're pretty miserable if you've not got money for food, but you know, above a certain amount, you're no happier for all that extra money. So it, it, you know, to me that, that wasn't a goal really as long as we had enough to 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 live on that was uh, that was all good and that's exactly and this may be circling around back around to what we started with you know i was in 18 years in a standard practice after doing residency and med school and all that stuff and that's why i said you know i'm concerned i have financial security the rest of my life and i'm walking into nothing and my wife said you know is it worth it if you have all the money in the world you don't enjoy it right if you're not happy yeah. like i would come home and and I'm a positive person like you both are. And I would come home. My wife would say, how was your day? I was like, oh, my gosh, I had three people yell at me. I got I, they were running behind all day and I got and it's never fun. It was never fun. Now I come home and I'm laughing and joking. And, you know, even yeah. my neighbors, we have dinner together and, and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll they'll say, I'm not asking you. They ask my wife, is Brian happier now? And she's like, oh, my, like almost tears in her eyes. Like he oh, loves yeah. his job. He loves what he does. And he he can't wait to go to work on Monday, really, you know? And so I think that's what's happening. And that's why it's so tragic. I, I want to pick on doctors sometimes, but I have such compassion too, because I know what they're going through and the reason yeah. they're not questioning, the reason they're not doing stuff, because right now doctors are very thought very lowly of no one trusts us anymore because of the system we're in. And and when you're hostage to a system and you have $400,000, $500,000 with the med school loans, and you, you can't really question the system. Like you were, a, a, you know, at a point in your career where I'm going to retire anyways. I really don't care what the all these people think anymore. I'm kind of getting to that stage of my career too, where I said, you know what? I'll, all I can do is the right thing. The thing that matters is that patient in front of me. Not what everyone else in the world thinks is what that patient thinks and what works for them, right? And how we can work together as a team and not say, well, this person over says you have to put everyone on insulin. And I've been in those situations where endocrinologists say, just put everyone on insulin, let them eat what they want, leave them alone. It's like, 
do you understand what you're doing to people? Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Dr. Ren, when I have to ask you, what was the hardest, what, what were the darkest days? What was the hardest days in your journey uh, after you started saying, hey, let's do these things? Were there, were there certain days where you said, it's just not worth it anymore? As a couple or both of you, you could both answer. Both of you got to that point where you said, it's just not worth the fight anymore. It's too much work. No, I think I think ever since we made that decision to do it, do this different thing, uh, it's just been... I don't know what David would say. I mean, there have been some time. He's been more, I haven't been personally attacked. So it's easier for me to say that. Um, I think, I think when the mail on, I think for me, Jen, when the mail on Sunday attacked me so badly. That was grim. I did lose it for a while. So the the mail on Sunday, they spent, I think it was five months trying to find something on me. So I lived under a horrible shadow because I knew they were, going it trying to get me trying to get me trying to get me um and and it just makes you sad because you i think none of us like to think that somebody in the world hates you mm-hmm. you want to feel people like you so uh the idea that a, a national newspaper can be pillaring you and it, you can't understand why because you think a bit like jen said shall i put all the patients back on insulin shall i just undo it all so that and it, yeah. for a little bit, it, 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 it got out of proportion for me and did make me sad because it actually broke when we were on holiday, didn't it, Jen? And you can't, when you know you're coming, that Sunday I knew it was going to be published in, in the national paper. and So I was, that was sad. But what I would say is, so the patients I saw yesterday who, who leave the room cheering or they just, they want to tell the world and I'm like, oh God, I feel so great. I've got so much energy and that. That's oxygen to me. And it keeps keeps me going. And then I go home and tell Jen, or the groups we run, after the groups, we're, aren't we, Jen? We're always like, oh, look at that one. And she's so much better. What do you think? So that oh, it, the, the, overall, it's, we wouldn't have done anything different at all. And and every time you have a low day, I I feel you need to think about the latest patient that we helped, something like that, and then that gives me a sense of proportion. Uh, but you, I think the other thing is 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 for us both to switch off and do something else mm. periodically. Yeah. I think that's that's for me. It's important. I know it is for you as well, Jen. Yeah. Yeah, just yeah. waste time and have fun and enjoy each other's company and not make it all about yeah. science all the time, right? Yeah. So yeah, I have to close do. with this. I don't. I, I want to be respectful of your time because it always goes way too fast for me when we're together. Um, we'll start with Jen. What's when you know my other podcast, Life's Best Medicine? Mm. Um, so what's Life's Best Medicine for you? Like where do you go to when things are hard or when you're, you know, getting well, questioned or you're going through the mud or whatever? Yeah, we each have our own little hobbies and then we love to do things together. So in terms of my my hobby, I'm a I'm a real big knitter and crochet crocheter. And if I wasn't on blur, you could see that <laughs> just oh, up yeah. here is my my yarn stash. So I I love that. And I've got a knitting group. And so when I relax in the evening, I'm knitting, crocheting, I'm making something creative. So I I absolutely love that. And um, we both, though, so we like to exercise together when we can. We walk or or run together. And I do a boot camp as well. I do a kind of ladies hilarious. We have loads of laughs, lifting weights, and it's all middle-aged women. So it's, it's absolutely perfect. And I do that three or four times a week. Um, and we live in an absolutely beautiful part of the the world here, so we can go lovely, lovely walks. And then, of course, you know, there's the the kids and seeing them and David's mom. So um, yeah, we have lots of nice downtime, either together or or separately. Go on, David. Is it my turn? <laughs> yes. Tell them about you. Tell them about your reserves. I want to tell you about my reserves, Brian. So uh, from the age of twelve. I've supported um, a bird sanctuary. And the thing is, I've outlived everybody in the bird sanctuary. So I'm now the senior trustee of a bird sanctuary. And we get left money in people's wills. And I personally manage five separate bird reserves. And I just can't, so I've got a tractor. So I love time on a tractor, just mowing grass, going up and down. I'm very observant of wildlife. 
And that gives me a mindfulness to notice the sun shining or I've seen a peregrine falcon or I'm very excited by insects, um, which is obviously mad, but I'm really excited by butterflies, noticing stuff like that. And I, I find myself sitting on my tractor singing and that's got to be good, hasn't it? I'm just going along uh, singing and, and that is a counterbalance to the low carb thing. Plus, uh, as I say, time with Jen, where we're like enjoying each other's company, really. Uh, so Jen's my best friend, aren't you, Jen? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We just chatter on, don't we? We love it if we're left to yeah. our own devices. You know, if we ever get yeah. any time to others, it's great. Go walk. That's ah, great. Go, you know, that's on my there. bucket list. One of these days, walking through the countryside with you and talking about life and what really matters. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Come and look at my reserve. Come and look at my reserves. Bring binoculars. I'll show you stuff. Okay. You teach me about birds. All right. Yeah. That sounds like a plan. Yeah. And insects and all that kind of fun stuff. Yeah. 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 That's all good. So, Jen, how do people find you? The fork in the oh. road, I know. Tell tell people yeah. all the other stuff you're working on so that they know how to find you and track you down and yeah. follow you on I Twitter do, to get your numbers up. Yeah, I do hang around on Twitter quite a lot. So it's at Jen underscore Unwin. Um, and yeah, I've written a little book called Fork in the Road. There's usually a copy hanging around here somewhere that I can sort of... Uh, all profits to the public health collaboration. I can't get it in focus. Anyway, oh, there you got it there. Perfect. When you're not trying, it's, it's perfect. Fork in the road. Fork yes, I love it. I have it on my. And we've got a journal, a journal out as well. All profits to the public health collaboration. Not not me um, in the UK, which is trying to sort of spread this information. And it's just a really simple book for people on on food addiction. So if, if people are struggling, you know, and they've even on a low carb diet, they haven't managed to kind of get to a place where they've got that sort of peace with food. Um, you know, there's some some advice in there for people. Um, and there is a website that goes with that. It's forkintheroad.co.uk. But uh, yes, yeah, so you can have a look at that. And we've also done some pages on the Public Health Collaboration website to do with food addiction. So that's www.phcuk.org. Um, and all do, all of David's in, sugar infographics and um, the diet sheet and everything's there as well. So if anyone wants to to follow up on any of that it's on the public health collaboration website and if they feel minded to give a little donation um that's the other thing we both really support is the public health collaboration and you know often we give speaker fees and stuff like that to 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 them to support their work to spread this information around the uk and internationally great dr dr david they, they you're just oh uh at low carb gp yes there we are. That's how you find me. And as Jen said, the resource page on the Public Health Collaboration has a lot of non-copyrighted material. Please steal it. Run away with it. I won't prosecute you. I'm hoping that people will use the teaspoon of sugar infographics. They're now in 17 languages. Uh, they've been downloaded millions of times uh, around the world. So there are seven infographics in 17 languages. More languages coming. I've got a, a paper coming out soon, I hope, in uh, BMJ Nutrition. And yeah, if you Google me, I, I'm there in all sorts of forms, um, but probably Twitter's the best. Thank you. Awesome. Hey, everyone, this is life-changing wisdom. This is great stuff. They're doing fantastic work, the Unwins, and, and, uh, and they're great, decent, nice people. And so, you know, take some of them with you, you know, be, be, be kind, you know, be kind to yourself, be kind to others and uh, go out and make a difference. And, you know, if you're a doc who's burned out, it's not the end of the road. Look, just look for a different road or change your path a little bit because, you know, I'm personally devastated by my friends and what they're going through right now. And, um, you know, stepping out of the system and, and, you know, again, like going back to that, it's not just all about the money. You, be, you went into this to be a doctor or to be a healer and, you know, we have to take care of ourselves at some point. So, you know, there's a lot of wisdom here. And, uh, you know, I'm glad this can be both on low carb MD and life's best medicine, my two passions, uh, you know, outside of medicine. Um, but thank you. Thank you so much for joining us and taking the time. And uh, this will have profound impact on people. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs>